Okay, well, welcome back. Uh, another beautiful day here in the Ozarks. It's pretty warm, but I think we're getting ready to have a, a cool down here with a little bit of rain finally. Um, we have been talking about Ozarks history in the last few weeks. We have specifically been talking about the early exploration of the Ozarks. Uh, today, we're going to talk about man by the name of Henry Rose Schoolcraft. Now, he for sure was not the first Anglo-white person American into the Ozarks, but he was the first one that came into the Ozarks and wrote about it. He did an extensive 90-day tour through the Ozarks, uh, went back and wrote a journal out. It got published, and it really had a great impact upon the settlement of the Ozarks. So, that's why we're so interested in him, because uh, he is an important figure. But more than that, we can really get a glimpse of what the Ozarks would have looked like 200 years ago, uh, because his journal, he was a, he was a geologist by training, and uh, his journal is just full of descriptions of the flora and the fauna of the Ozarks. So for that reason, uh, his journal is extremely important to us. So let's get into this and see what we can see. So we're talking about the early American explorations. Now, I always spotlight a famous Ozarker. And uh, you're looking at a young man here standing in front of a house. Looks like it would have been taken probably in the late 40s, early 50s. Uh, if you look close, you can kind of get an idea of maybe who this is. If you haven't figured it out yet, I know you'll figure it out now. This is Mickey Mantle, if not the greatest baseball player that ever played Major League Baseball, most surely one of the greatest players. Um, came from Commerce, uh, Oklahoma, which is just right across, right across the border from uh, Missouri, uh, raised up in right west of the Joplin area, uh, played ball there as a young man, was scouted by a uh, real famous scout from Willard, Missouri, man by the name of uh, Tom Greenway, and was uh, purchased by the New York Yankees and became probably the greatest, one of the greatest baseball players in the 1950s and 60s, for sure. Uh, one of my boyhood idols growing up, I just absolutely idolized Mickey Mantle as a, as a young boy. Uh, unfortunately, I had about one-tenth of one percent of his ability to play baseball. Uh, he most certainly uh, was a better baseball player than I was. So that's our spotlighted famous Ozarker for the day, Mickey Mantle. So let's look at the early explorations of the Ozarks. Now, before Schoolcraft, there were a couple of other explorations. Uh, the Louisiana Purchase uh, and the Lewis and Clark exploration there was one by uh, Zebulon Pike and one by Stephen Long. Now, we're going to look at each one of these. The Lewis and Clark expedition really just touched on the very fringes of the upper part of the Ozarks, but it did have a part to play in the uh, early Ozarks exploration. Uh, early on, the United States government desired to control the port city of New Orleans. I, I think we know this story. You've probably heard it hundreds of times and in your past and on TV and maybe back in the classroom, uh, we wanted New Orleans before we, you know, it became part of the United States. The problem was uh, Napoleon in France controlled not just New Orleans, but all the Western part of what we now call the United States, a lot of it. So Napoleon had not been uh, receptive to selling it. But all of a sudden, now the clear blue, he uh, desired to sell it. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, he was involved with a very costly war with uh, Britain in Europe, and he needed money. Uh, on top of that, he really realized he probably was not able to defend Louisiana, uh, the territory from the British, because British control Canada, what we now know as Canada, and they just bordered it. And they thought, they thought, you know, there's no way I can afford to send a bunch of troops to the new world and defend this land. On top of that, he needed money. Uh, 
he had to pay his troops. You know, soldiers oftentimes would not fight unless they were paid. In fact, case most of the time they would not. Um, he also didn't need Louisiana anymore for a food source because he had lost the slave plantation uh, in the island of Hispaniola, which is now controlled by two countries, Haiti and the Dominican Republic. So he basically decided he wanted to sell it. Now, Jefferson, President Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson was very interested in buying New Orleans in what was known as West Florida, which is kind of the coastline of the Gulf Coast. He really didn't even think about buying Louisiana because he had no idea that Napoleon was ready to sell it. So he sent some of his people over to uh, Paris to negotiate with Napoleon, and he was prepared to offer him $2 million for New Orleans, just for the city of New Orleans. Well, out of the clear blue sky, Napoleon counteroffered. He said, no, I won't do that, but I'll sell you the whole Louisiana territory for $15 million. Now, that was a lot of money back in those days. But nevertheless, the negotiators realized what a fantastic bargain this was. And so they signed an agreement buying it. Here's the deal. They didn't have the authority to do that. Uh, they absolutely had no authority to buy the Louisiana Territory. When they came back, and you got to remember, this is the days before telephones and telegraphs and internets and all this, and it took them several months to get back. And when they arrived in Washington, they told Jefferson, no, we were not able to buy New Orleans, but we bought the whole thing. Jefferson was a little shocked, and frankly, um, although he was happy he was concerned that the Congress would not come forth with the money. And in fact, there was quite a debate about this because uh, this was a period of time in American history when the country was really divided. Uh, the Jefferson Adams election in 1800 had been one of the nastiest and worst in American history, if you can imagine. I know we think that we're in a period of time when politics are so polarizing, it was about that bad in 1800. And so he wasn't for sure if Congress would come forth with the money to buy this, but they did. And so he was able to purchase it. And at that point, uh, he had purchased all this here in pink, which includes the state of Missouri and the Ozarks. Now, here's the deal. Nobody really knew what was out here. This was all basically unexplored territory. There had been mountain men out here. There had been people that had been out here for some years, but nobody really had a very good idea about what was all involved with this area. It had never been mapped. Uh, we didn't even know for sure where our boundary line was. So for that reason, he decided he needed to have it explored. And so he sent out, and you know the story, it's been told again many, many times, he sent out two of his uh, important people that he trusted very much, uh, Meriwether Lewis and uh, George Rogers Clark, pardon me, William Clark, and uh, sent him out to explore, and that became the core of discovery. And they left in May of 1804 and returned in September of 1806. They traveled over 8,000 miles. Uh, and they uh, traveled all the way to the Pacific Ocean and turned around and came back. Once they got back, uh, they had they had basically explored at least a little bit of what we now know as Louisiana Territory. Now, that exploration only touched real briefly up on the northern edge of the Ozarks along the Missouri River. But for the most part, they didn't even attempt to come into the Ozarks. That wasn't their job. The next two men did travel through the Ozarks. Zebulon Pike was the first one. Right after Lewis and Clark got back, he was sent out west to explore the southwest uh, along what we now know as the Santa Fe tra Trail out to Mexico, New Mexico area. Uh, this took him along the Osage River. So he most definitely did travel through the upper regions of the Ozarks. He eventually traversed the Arkansas River and the Colorado River, 
uh, into Spanish Southwest where he discovered the Rocky Mountain Peak, which now bears his name, Pikes Peak. I'm sure some names have been there. Uh, his trek, his exploration is still just a little bit controversial because if you don't know, there was a plot afoot by Aaron Burr, the then vice president, and a general who actually was kind of in charge of the Army of the West, a man by the name of James Wilkinson. And uh, apparently they were going to try to detach part of the Louisiana Territory from the United States and set it up as a separate country led by themselves. Uh, this it was a very, uh, you know, bad plot. And in fact, this is one of the reasons that Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton had their famous duel. Um, very interesting part of American history. If you've never read about it or looked at it, uh, might not hurt for you to get online or, or pick up a book about it and read a little bit about it because it was a very interesting time. Uh, Could have really resulted in something completely different <laughs> if they had been successful. Uh, whether or not Zebulon Pike was a part of this is still up to debate. Most people assume he was not aware of what these two were doing, but there are some people that think he was. Uh, but he did traverse through the northern part of the Ozarks. And then in 1819, Stephen Long, another general, was sent west to survey what ultimately became the Santa Fe Trail. And this most certainly did take him through the western Ozarks. But again, that's not what he was really dealing with. He was just traveling through the Ozarks to get to the southwest. Here's the important thing about Stephen Long's expedition. When he made his map out of this area, he is the first person to put on a map the Ozark Mountains or Ozark Plateau. So he is generally credited with not I, you can't say they named it because it was obviously already known as that by some people, but he's the one that first put it on a map. And so his map became the first, you know, uh, map showing the uh, Ozark Plateau. This is Zebulon Pike's route. Shows him come down through St. Louis. You can see he definitely came through the northern part of the Ozarks and up around here to Pike's Peak and circling around came back through into Mexico and here. So, and this is uh, Stephen Long's map. You can't see it because this isn't a good enough map and I was never able to get a good enough map to show you. But it actually says Ozarks Plateau right here. Uh, obviously not a very accurate map, but uh, you know, it says the Ozarks Plateau right here. This is what he saw in Missouri. So that was his map of the area. Uh, and this kind of shows you the map of the western part of the United States. It's not a very accurate map, but you know, at least it's there. Okay, so that leads us to Henry Rose Schoolcraft. Now, again, I'm sure most of you have never heard of Henry Rose Schoolcraft. Most people in the Ozarks haven't heard of Henry Rose Schoolcraft. He just, you know, he's one of these people that is so important to our area, and yet he absolutely, uh, you know, is kind of a forgotten man. So who was he? Well, he's the first white American to extensively explore and write about the interior of the Ozarks. Born in March of 1793, he was born upstate New York. Uh, he was a college graduate, Middlebur Middlebury College in Vermont, and uh, he studied chemistry, geology, minerals, etc. And upon graduation, he opened a glass factory. Unfortunately, he wasn't very good at making glass because it failed. So he needed money. And he decided, I'm going to go west. And I'm going to try to find a place to explore and write about in hopes that I will get a job with the government. You know, he thought this was the best, best way for me to make a living was to get a job with the government. And he thought with his abilities and his knowledge of minerals and geology that he would go somewhere out west where there had never been anybody and explore it and write about it and maybe get the attention of the government. Here's the problem. Henry Rose Schoolcraft was about as much of an outdoorsman as most of us are today. 
he absolutely did not know anything about the outdoor living. He was a he was a college graduate. He was he was used to living back east. Um, he had very few outdoor skills. It's a real wonder the guy made it. I'll be honest with you. Had it not been for some of the rough settlers in the Ozarks that he encountered, which by the way he denigrated to a great degree, uh, it's it's really lucky that he made it at all. Uh, arrived in St. Louis. And uh, finding out a little bit about the Ozarks, decided that's where he would go. So in the fall of 1818, uh, after living with Moses Austin, remember we talked about Moses Austin last week near Potosi, um, he took off traveling. Now, he did have the good sense to uh, hire out a local man that did have outdoor skills, a man by the name of Levi Pettibone. And Levi Pettibone was kind of his guide. Uh, had it not been for Levi, I am almost assured that Henry Rose Schoolcraft would have died. He absolutely had no business. He was, first of all, he chose the winner to do this, which wasn't real smart on his hand. Uh, so he took off, uh, began on Thursday, November 5th, 1818, and arrived back in Potosi on Thursday, February 4th, 1919, 1819, pardon me, that's wrong date there and was the last to exactly uh, he was out there exactly 90 days and covered approximately 900 miles so in this journey he took he basically explored the ozarks and wrote about it this is a photograph of henry rose schoolcraft a little bit later uh, obviously uh, when he was more mature he was only in his early 20s when he did this he was a very young man uh, now, here's a map, and again, this is too small a map for you guys to see uh, and really clearly understand, but I can kind of point it out to you. Up here is Potosi, and this is where he started out, and he would come down this way, uh, traversing along what was called the Osage Trace until he got about right here, and then he took off down into this area. Uh, today, if uh, you were looking at places where he was. Uh, you would basically be taking along the Big Piney River uh, in this area through here. Here is Ashley's Cave, which he talks about in uh, in his journal. He travels on down uh, through uh, Oregon County and Douglas County and Ozark County uh, in this area. Uh, kind of does a little circle down here travels back along uh, the White River, pardon me, the, uh, yes, the White River, and then takes a journey up this way, and this is Springfield, this is where I live, uh, and he got all the way to the east side of Springfield, when there, obviously, uh, found a lead uh, diggings place where somebody along Pierce's Creek was digging some lead, and surveyed this area out here, got in, probably rode his horse out in this area. It was unoccupied at this time. And he wrote about those beautiful descriptive plains that we talked about way back when he was talking about the geography of the Ozarks. Then he took back down uh, this way, hit the White River again, and followed the White River all the way down into North Arkansas until they got around Batesville, current day Batesville, and took back up along the Black River and the St. Francis River, all the way back up to Potosi. 900 miles, 90 days. And he kept his journal, an extensive journal about this. So let's kind of look at an overview of his, of his uh, journey. Uh, again, it's remembered primarily for the descriptions of the rugged landscape and the minerals and the rocks and the plants. He also journeyed across most of the major rivers and streams in the southern Ozarks. The negative part about this, he did encounter uh, some very rough settlers. Now, there were people out in the Ozarks, but folks, they were like mountain men. Uh, some of them had women, some of them didn't. Uh, they were just, I, I would probably make a guess that there probably was no more than a few hundred people living in what we now call the Ozarks. And they were very much scattered. They very much usually lived along a riverbank uh, because that was, you know, very important. Uh, he 
was not very uh, nice about his description of the people. I'm going to read you the descriptions here in a few minutes about some of the people he encountered. Uh, this later on probably had a lot of effect upon the stereotype of the hillbilly, the Ozarks hillbilly, that we talked about the very first day we start talking about the Ozarks. Uh, he wrote about the lead minings, it weren't really mines, they were diggings, they were just digging in the ground, looking for lead along Pearson Creek, just east of present day Springfield. And again, that was a very important thing, lead. Remember, Moses Austin was a, a big uh, technology man about lead, and uh, <clears throat> that was what they were looking for a lot. He was thoroughly impressed with the James River Valley and the plains west of Springfield. And again, we read that description of it. And he was also very impressed with the White River Valley as well. This is Smallen Cave. He actually found Smallen Cave. And that's located around Ozark, Missouri today, just south of Springfield. And again, we talked about that when we talked about the geography of the Ozarks. So what was the result of this trip? So he, he's out here for 90 days, 900 miles, and he comes back and he writes his journal. Well, first of all, it is the first documented exploration of the interior of the Ozarks. Again, there were people living out there, but there were not more than probably a few hundred at the very most, maybe not even that many. Uh, and they were just living isolated lives, almost like I said, mountain men type lives. Um, and Frankly, they, they were trying to get away from people. They didn't want the Ozarks to be known. Um, he provided a very detailed description of the natural flora and fauna, uh, which is very important uh, to give us an idea of what the land looked like. Now, a lot of people are very critical of his portrayal of the rugged settlers. And again, uh, he, he did not have good things to say about the people he encountered. By the way, if you are interested, uh, a geography professor at Missouri State University, a man by the name of Dr. Milton Rafferty, reprinted his journal in a book some years ago called Rude Pursuits and Rugged Peaks. That's not what Schoolcraft called it, but that's what he gave the title, Rafferty did. And uh, he said, Schoolcraft viewed the settlers a most complete lack of education, superstitious beliefs, lackadaisical attitude towards work from the perspective one freshly minted with bourgeois family values that stressed hard work, achievement, and financial success. So when he looked at these people, he didn't see anything he liked. But again, folks, had it not been for these people, he probably would have died. Uh, it, you know, he was very lucky to have got back with his life. Uh, more importantly, his journal provided a stimulus for further exploration and settlement of the region. He went back. He had this journal published. It caught the attention of the government. He did succeed in doing exactly what he wanted to do, which was to get a job with the government. And as I'll show you here in a few minutes, it uh, became a very important part of the early settlement of the upper Mississippi Valley uh, in the Minnesota, Michigan area. Um, so, you know, he did exactly what he wanted to do. It also provided a kind of a, uh, thing for people looking for some place to go. It kind of gave them a view of this, and his description of the area was so beautiful that people thought, man, this is an area I want to live in. And so people began to come into the Ozarks more than what they already had. Uh, so here's a copy of the book, Rude Pursuits and Rugged Peaks. Um, um, might be able to find it in your library. If not, uh, you might be able to find it online. I'm sure you can buy it through Amazon. You can buy anything through Amazon. Uh, so it's a it's a really good, interesting book if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Uh, I thought I'd come read you a couple of descriptions of the Ozark frontiersman that he uh, came upon. Uh, here's a description of the Wells cabin in Ozark County. Monday, November 30th, 1818, Wells had several acres of ground in the state of cultivation and a new built log house consisting of one room. Its interior would disappoint any person who has never had an opportunity of witnessed an abode of a man beyond the pale of the civilized world. Not exactly a nice description. 
Nothing could be more remote from the ideas of domestic comfort, neatness, or convenience without allusion to cleanliness and order. In the evening, I tried to engage our hostess and her daughter in small talk. They could only talk of bears, hunting, and the like. The rude pursuits and the coarse enjoyments of the hunter state was all they knew. The folks, had it not been for these people, he would have died because they fed him, they gave him shelter, and uh, some of them let him stay with them for quite a few days. Wednesday, November 9th, uh, 1818, he uh, arrived at the Coker cabin in Boone County. Uh, nothing could present a more striking picture of the hardships encountered by the backwoods settler than this poor, friendless, and forlorn family. In manners, morals, customs, dress, contempt of labor and hospitality, the state of society is not essentially different from that which exists among savages. Schools, religion, and learning are alike unknown. Uh, it's lucky <laughs> they were nice to him. Uh, of course, they had no idea this is what he was going to say about them. You know, uh, I'm sure that he was friendly to them, and and they gave him comfort. They gave him food. They gave him shelter. But uh, he in turn did not give them a very good description. And you know, his description description may have been somewhat uh, true. It's just that sometimes you know things are better left unsaid. Uh, here's kind of a uh, woodcut of an early log cabin, uh, pioneer life in Missouri in 1820. So uh, again, that kind of gives you an idea of what he would have encountered. So what happened to Schoolcraft after he got out of the Ozarks? Well, uh, again, it's very important to us to study its history, uh, but it was really minor in comparison to his later achievements. He became a very successful person. Uh, he did get a job with the United States government. And as a result of his journal, he was appointed to be the main naturalist for the exploration of the Great Lakes area. And uh, so he was assigned to the Great Lakes area up around Minnesota, Michigan, and that area. And it was here that he is the person that is generally credited with discovering the source of the Mississippi River. A pretty big deal, folks. Uh, so Schoolcraft got a job uh, with the government. He was sent up to the upper Mississippi River Valley area. And during his exploration of that area, he discovered the source of the biggest river in the United States. Uh, he also became a champion of the many Native American tribes, uh, even married an Ojibwa, uh, one of the uh, Native American of, the, of that tribe up in the area around Minnesota. Uh, by the way, if you don't know, uh, one of the famous Ojibwe Indians in America is a young country singer called Shania Twain. She's part of the Ojibwe tribe. Uh, over the course of the next several decades, he wrote about 30 books on Native American history. So he became a champion of the Native Americans, and he became kind of an expert on it. In fact, the case he is generally considered to be one of, if not the greatest, 19th century ethnologist, one who studies a culture of the North American Native Americans. Um, he was he was really became quite a famous person in his day, not for what he did in the Ozarks, but for what he did elsewhere. Um, so uh, pretty important. One of his books, one of these 30 books, uh, actually served as a kind of source for Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's epic poem, Hiawatha, which was one of the most famous poems in the 19th century in America. And uh, he used the descriptions of some of these Indians to form his idea of Hiawatha. Uh, unfortunately for Henry Rose Schoolcraft, uh, he died penniless in 1864 uh, after a series of strokes. And, uh, you know, really, uh, his end of his life wasn't very good. And again, folks, uh, he is almost a forgotten man in the Ozarks. And it's really a shame because other than uh, a highway that borders the eastern edge of Springfield, Highway 65, uh, which is actually the Henry Rose Schoolcraft Freeway, other than that, uh, 
people don't even know he existed in the Ozarks. He's just he's just a forgotten man. Uh, here is a monument that was put up, and it's very hard to see, but it says Henry Rose Schoolcraft, geologist, uh, explorer, and ethnologist, camped here January, I think it's 1st, 1819 site. Uh, the first uh, lead mine and primitive smelter in southwest Missouri. Uh, and uh, I can't even read the rest of it. Anyway, it's put up by the University Club of Springfield, Missouri. They they did many of these. So this is kind of the only thing. And it's, you know, most people don't even know this exists. Uh, there ought to be a statue to the guy somewhere. Well, I have finished early. I I guess I didn't have as much material as I thought I had. So next week, we're going to talk about the American settlement of the Ozarks. Once Henry Rose Schoolcraft uh, went out and published a journal, then it was a uh, it was something that that made people want to move into the Ozarks. And so people begin to move into the Ozarks in larger numbers. Uh, to the point that by 1850, uh, there was a pretty good population in the Ozarks. Springfield had been settled. Um, it was a, a town of several hundred people. Uh, there were several others, major towns in the Ozarks. So that's what we're going to talk about next week. We're going to talk about the American settlement of the Ozarks. So again, um, I got done early today. Uh, I hope you have a good week. And we will see you next week. Thank you. Have you, have you read that book? Rude Pursuits and Rugged Peaks. Okay. Have you read it? Oh, yes. <laughs> I've read it several times. I've got a copy of it right in here in my room. So. so you think I can get it on Amazon? Oh, I'm sure you can get it on Amazon. I have no doubt. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Rude uh, Pursuits and Rugged Peaks by Schoolcraft. Right. By Henry Rowe Schoolcraft. Uh, it might have Milton Rafferty's name by it also, because he's the guy that republished it. Okay. Very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, again, sorry I didn't use up all my time today, but no. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. Yes. yes. Thank you, Donna. Bye-bye. We got in late because we had fallen asleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that happened. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. We'll see you next week. Bye.